10 for me, okay? And you're in the street. And I'm Malika Bilal. Gender-based violence knows no borders, especially in this digital world. Today, we discuss how to end online violence against women. Share your thoughts. You can tweet us at 8 Stream or leave a comment in a live YouTube chat and you'll also be in the street. November 25th is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. The goal is to bring attention to gender-based violence. It's an issue that continues to plague women and girls around the globe, despite a 1994 United Nations resolution aimed at tackling the problem. And in this age of the internet, new forms of violence are surfacing. Online gender-based violence can be in numerous forms, such as sexual harassment, um, revenge porn, doxing, trolling, and even the threat of physical violence. The impact is that it undermines the work of women, especially black and black women and women of color, um, and that it also pokes holes in their confidence, making it difficult for them to come online and do their activism. We need our governments to step up and work hard towards ensuring that the rights of women are protected both online and offline. Joining us to discuss this in Islamabad, Pakistan, Heather Barr. She's the acting co-director of the Women's Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. In London, England, Shayi Akiwowo. She's the founder and executive director of Glitch. That's a non-profit organization determined to end online abuse. And in San Antonio, Texas, artist and activist Ashley Fairbanks. Her work focuses on finding creative ways to enact social change. Welcome, everyone, to the stream. Uh, it would be hard-pressed to find a woman, at least in our community, who can't, sadly, relate to today's topic, ourselves included here on set, I know. I want to bring in a few of those people who share with us some of their thoughts. This first one is Ari. Ari on Twitter says, online violence against women and girls is part of a continuum of violence against women. Women and girls online are at risk of very violent attacks that go from sexist and misogynistic hate speech to brutal threats. And a great number of these attacks target their gender. Shayi, why is it important, as Ariel here explains, to categorize online violence and online abuse under violence against women? Language is so important. If we talk about online abuse as a form of violence, then we start treating the symptoms as um, as trauma, and we start looking at solutions as if it is violence, because it is. And we also start looking and investing in the root problems. When we have language that still belittles online abuse and its impact, it means it's setting us back. And we've gone, we've made too much progress actually offline around reclaiming the night, around reclaiming our public spaces to have to repeat this, this same narrative online. And we have a lot of victim blaming when it comes to online abuse, which means women suffer in silence and are not seeking support, are not speaking out um, because of the fear of more abuse. And it's really important to understand its intersections with other identities. Black women, women of colour are most likely to face online abuse and also more likely to be silenced by other white women and other, other people. Shay, you're not just saying this because you've seen it, it's a theory that you have, you are living this pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis. Can you give us one example so we really understand where you're coming from? I mean, you're absolutely right. So just yesterday we spoke out about um, a backlash of a film talking about urban and urban urban issues and the amount of abuse that we have seen on social media the last 48 hours has been ridiculous. The the display of the N word and it's been, the diverse use of it has been disgusting. And the fact that tech companies have not been able to pick up um, this language is infuriating. But it's not just me. It's MPs who have cited that online abuse is one of the reasons why they're standing down here in the UK and um, at the next election. We've also got Diane Abbott, our first black female MP, first shadow home secretary, saying that the amount of abuse that her staff have to deal with every single day. And that's really important because the levels of trauma that online violence has is not just on the individual, it's on their friends, their family, it affects their workplace, it affects their finances, all criteria of violence, which is why it's so important that we acknowledge online and offline violence on this day. Ashley, I see you nodding. Go ahead, articulate that nod. <laughs> Yeah, well, I just used to be the digital director for Ilhan Omar, who's one of our first Muslim commerce women here in the U.S. And the amount of threats and violence she faced online, um, obviously, like, she was very brave in the face of them every day. 
Um, but, you know, as the person who had to read every comment, who has to forward those comments uh, on to, for investigation, it was horrifying to see what was normalized. Almost every tweet, you know, would have, you know, threatening language. And it was it was brutal every day. Would you and mind? I think that's, yeah, go, go ahead, Shay. Go ahead. No, I was going to just say, I think that's really important to acknowledge because there are women and young girls that are looking at our politicians who are finally seeing themselves um, in people like Ilhan, in AOC, in America, but also all around the world. And then they also see the abuse that they receive. And that is massively off-putting. Um, we have young girls saying that I don't think politics is for me, small p and little okay. p. And so the over overflowing impact of this is needs to be tracked as well. So I one of the things... Go ahead, Heather. <laughs> Go ahead, Heather. No, I was just going to say that, um, I, I mean, I think there's a real continuum between violence offline and violence online. And, and one of the things that's interesting that the UN has actually started recommending is that in orders of protection that are issued, for example, in family violence cases, that judges also look at including online violence um, as part of those orders. And one of the issues that we've been looking at where I think the internet has really taken it and old-fashioned abuse and, and sort of put it into hyperdrive is sharing of images online, intimate images um, that, that people either didn't know were being taken or consented to having taken but didn't expect, didn't consent to having shared online. And, and we really saw an example of that in the Katie Hill case where we had this incredibly promising young woman who was driven out of, of a political career by non-consensually shared images. Mm. So as you yeah, all the, the, as you all are talking, I want to I want to jump in here because I want to give people um, a little taste of what this is like and what it's like for me as a woman going into our YouTube comment section. Sometimes sometimes it's full of really intelligent comments, and other times, not so much. So I'll, I'll give you just a little taste. You can see here um, some people are saying online violence in tweet in in, in quotes. How is cyberbullying real? Just turn off your computer. Um, and another person writes in, online violence isn't real. Uh, another says, LOL, there's a lot of laughing. Um, why, does, why do men need to help solve this problem? This isn't a thing. So it goes on and on, and I, get, I could scroll forever in that. But Ashley, I want to pick up on the point that Heather was making about why this is real and why it's not something you can just turn off your computer and pretend didn't happen. Talk about your experience. Yeah, so I mean, very often the things that happen online, there's you know less and less of a boundary between that and our real lives, um, and it's frequently paired with doxing too. So people are not, you know not just sharing those intimate images, but then also sharing what your details are of like where you live or whatever. And the experience I have in my life is, um, you know, when I was younger, uh, I a, a person got me you know, intoxicated and filmed me performing a sexual act against my will. And for years, I was haunted by that video being out there on the Internet. He released it on a message board that I had moderated at the time. Um, and you know, I didn't talk about it for a decade because I was so terrified uh, that one day those images would be released and ruin my career. And every job that I get, it was like, when will this when will those happen? So when things happened to Katie Hill, uh, the congresswoman from California who resigned, uh, it just prompted me to share my story and say, we shouldn't actually have to be like in the closet about having these things out there because it's actually pretty normal. Um, and they're being used against us all the time. There's something that's really important to see in our <laughs> workshops as well. Young, young girls, we deliver workshops on digital citizenships and young girls are terrified about their career and leaving school because some of them have made informed decisions and are being sexually expressive and IT is facilitating that. But some of them have been coerced into sharing um, images of themselves and they're now really worried about their careers. And I think this is going to be the new form of gender-based violence online that will be used to, mm. against women um, who want to stand in public life. And you know, I'm seeing some of the comments that have come through underneath here and I'm also seeing some of the comments that you've read out. That's why it's really important when we talk about online abuse, not to just um, talk about it as if it's just trolling. Online abuse is a very yeah. much an umbrella term for all of the different tactics. And just saying somebody just should block it is not going to help the situation that Ashley's just talked about. It's not going to help somebody who is being dead named, which affects trans communities where their previous name and identity is brought up online. So it's really important. Shari, like, can you just slow down like, for a second? Because there's a phrase that and I thought I, I knew a lot about online <laughs> harassment, dead named. That one's new to me. Can you explain what that means? 
Yeah, so dead naming tends to affect trans communities the most, and it's where people, it's where somebody will maliciously use their previous name or bring up their previous name or previous photo, and that tends to happen to a lot of young trans people who are online, so have wow. lived through both identities, and that gets used against them um, to ridicule them, to make them feel embarrassed, to try and, and, and you know, scare them off the platform. And blocking is not going to help that situation. And that's why I think it's really important that we talk about revenge porn or the sharing of non-consensual photography. We talk about doxing, but we also talk about hacking. We talk mm. about in real life attacks that happened to Joe Cox MP a couple of years ago. That took place through organizing online. And blocking is not the solution here. And let me it's just really remind everybody, Joe Cox, that MP, was murdered. Right. Was so murdered I just wanted to... Yeah. Yes, Heather? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in and, and follow on Shay's point about um, educating people, especially young people, about um, being a responsible internet user. I mean, we look at this issue globally and women's rights issues globally in general, and it's very difficult to find a government anywhere in the world that's doing a good job of including comprehensive sexuality education in their schools. Um, and it's incredibly clear that how you use the internet and what consent means in the context of the internet is, is a crucial part of what children need to be learning these days. And what we need to teach people is not that you shouldn't allow yourself to be photographed. We should all be allowed, we should all be able to photograph any part of our body we want, doing anything we want, any time, without there being any um, expectation that that means that, that that's now free for anyone to share anywhere. Um, but children just aren't being told that in in pretty much any country we can think of. Mm. I'm, glad, I'm, glad that, about I'm glad that you raised that. Now, now here you're coming in, Ashley, I'll give this to you, but I'm glad that uh, Heather raised that because it's kind of pushing it into what then do we do about this? Education being one of those things. So tackling the problem is one of the things we want to make sure we bring out in today's show. And to that point, we asked the stream community for ways that they'd like to see the problem addressed. Here are just a few of their thoughts. One solid solution Pakistani uh, young women and girls uh, have is actually the National Cyber Harassment Helpline that Digital Rights Foundation started in 2016. And women from anywhere in Pakistan can call us and can get a support around uh, digital security help or uh, legal help. We know that sexual violence happens to all women but particularly for women of color and in my own case for black women, the stories that they tell can be empowering because they're often ignored and marginalized. It's my hope that there becomes a much more deepened understanding of race and gender politics. Hold your workplaces and your communities accountable for supporting you. Uh, because in fact, when people are isolated in this way, it is much, much harder to respond, much harder to continue to speak out if they are activists, to run for office if they're politicians, to be journalists if they're writers. So Ashley, from holding people accountable to setting up a national cyber harassment helpline, what's your take? I think um, what Heather just said about affirmative consent education is incredibly important. In my home state of Minnesota, uh, we've been fighting really hard to get affirmative consent education passed as a, a standard for everyone, um, just so that people know that you have to opt in uh, to sexual activity, and that could be you know, actual physical acts, or it's the sharing of photos as well, right? Um, but then there actually has to be a massive cultural shift that happens. So we can put all kinds of legal standards in place and different kinds of education in place, but there really has to be a shift in the idea that, uh, you know, small acts of harassment online are just building to those next mm. levels, right? So we have a continuum of violence. Ashley, do you, you mind, start out do you mind like, if I share something yeah. that, you, that, that you put together that a lot of people are sharing? Uh, and and this, is, this is Tracy Spicer, she tweeted this out. A sexual violence pyramid, but this pyramid was created by you and explains beautifully what you're about to say, but let's do it via the pyramid. Tell us, explain it to us just very briefly how it starts at the yeah. bottom with, it's just a joke, and then how at the very top, the pinnacle, we end up with murder. How is this a teaching yeah, I tool? I took a lot of like really dense academic text and turned yeah. this into like this cartoon version. And it's huh. now been translated to like 14 languages, uh, talking about how those base level jokes um, or language, you know, using someone's pronouns incorrectly, those things build upon the next level. They normalize that behavior mm. so that you can do that next thing and people don't really look at it as much, right? right. It's just like any kind of like oppressive system um, that you're building a ladder 
so that eventually, you know, that gets to that physical abuse and yeah. then eventually to those crimes and then to, with, you know, femicide being the end result, right? right. The, the death of women. So to so anyone who's watching this and thinking, oh, it's just cyber harassment, it's just online, turn your phone off. There's just very little gap here between harassment threats and verbal abuse to where we get physical violence on, on individuals and then uh, just real tragedy there right at the very top, right at the very pinnacle. I want to share something with you. This is Liz Lee. She's the founding executive director of Online SOS. That is an NGO helping other victims of online harassment. She talked to AJ Plus last year, and this is what she talked about. AJ Plus was looking at the dark side of the internet. Have a look. I was just a girl out of college. I just graduated, moved back to New York City starting my first job in finance, you know, excited to be in the real world and getting these strange emails. I got an email that had a, kind of an implicit threat in it where like, if you don't show up on this day, you know, I will do X, Y, and Z. But I didn't know what to do about it. Um, do I tell my employer? Do I tell my parents? Mm -hmm. And it's one-on-one. -on -one, so it doesn't matter if anyone knows about it. It's just meant for the target. Mm -hmm to be afraid. Liz uh, Lee didn't know what to do about it, so she set up her own NGO, Heather. What do people do if this is happening to them? Well, I think one of the problems is that there often aren't good options for mm. people. I mean, you've shown some people like um, Nigat Dad, who's doing such interesting work in Pakistan. Um, but what we found in our work in South Korea is that um, People sometimes try to go to the police, but um, but that rarely ends well. We heard about terrible experiences with, you know, police being dismissive or laughing or passing pictures around the police station, you know, intimate pictures and, and sort of comparing notes and laughing about them or telling, telling victims that they need to give the photo themselves to the police. Um, so I think there's a huge amount of work to be done in terms of reforming criminal justice responses. But I think there are a lot of other responses as well. We don't want putting people in jail to be the solution to everything. And so we need to look at options like being able to sue the person who did this and perhaps also being able to sue the platform that knew that it was there and that it was evidence of a crime and didn't take it down. Mm. I think it's really just important to jump in here and talk about when what happens when you try and access justice and the amount of barriers that people face. and. If you are a he in a heterosexual relationship or you're heterosexual, it's easier for you to go to law enforcement. But if you're a homosexual or bisexual it, it, and you're in a country um, where legislation is just been introduced or doesn't exist, you are basically outing yourself and putting a target on your back. And that is what people around the world have told us and disclosed. And that's why we make sure when we're talking about recommendations, we have a global output that we don't recommend things here that are... Uh, censoring or curtailing on freedom of expression, but also um, doesn't acknowledge the fact that not everybody has the human rights that we all aspire to have. And I think education is really important. I think we don't discuss enough what digital citizenship means. We understand with every right comes responsibilities and we've not started to craft out what it means to be an online citizen. And that's going to be an, an evolving identity. Every time there's a new tech piece of technology um, or issue, we're going to have to adapt and change. But we've never had that conversation. And, and you know, today the Web Foundation have put out a social contract or a new contract for the web and really want to make sure there's access around the, um, around the world to the internet. And I think that's fantastic. And we've signed up saying that as you are trying to get more and more people signed up to the internet. There must be digital citizenship education that goes alongside it. There must be safety training for women that, that goes alongside it because you are providing mobile phones to women in rural communities, which you think is empowering, and to some extent it is, but you are also putting them in real danger of their fa in, within conservative families or villages. We've had stories of women talk about having to being forced to take photos of themselves, and then being and then and that being sold and being and now being you know on that pathway to now trafficking. So we have to really think about the intersections here and how we 
want to embrace the online space. It is an amazing, um, amazing tool for, and it is a social good, but only if we all keep making sure it's a social good and take responsibility for it. Mm. Shay, you mentioned being think, yeah, think, an, an online okay. citizen, and I think uh, there's someone online in our community who brought up something I hadn't thought of before, but part of that work starts at the very beginning with language. I want to bring in this from Asha, who says, language is critical. Revenge insinuates a prior relationship that has broken down, leading to an act of revenge. This is not often the case. Porn indicates sexual pleasure can be gained from these images, re-victimizing the survivor. This is image-based sexual abuse. And she, of course, is referring to uh, what several of you have alluded to, the, 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 the attempt to shame people by sharing pictures or images or videos. She goes on to say the digital space is crucial in facilitating trafficking of women and girls for sexual exploitation globally. This is not just an issue of hate speech, but an acknowledgement of the impact of digital technology on our lived violent reality. So with that, Ashley, where should this onus lie? Is it on the individual person or is it also on the social media companies? Is it on governments? I think that's a thing that we have kind of missed so far is that a lot of the, the, the gender divide in the tech space, the gender disparity that we have so few women present at the what? top levels of leadership and throughout the, the process that you, they miss what the reality, like the lived reality for women is. So they don't understand as they're making terms of service agreements, as they're you know building in safety devices into platforms, there's critical voices missing at those tables that are saying, here's the problems we're dealing with and how do we address those things, right? So I think there's a massive onus on tech companies um, and a massive you know thing for governments to catch up like our policies are so far behind where they need to be to keep people safe on the internet. And that's present in violence against women, but it's also present in, you know, our huge fight against white supremacy, especially online and white supremacist violence. Actually, it's also I mean, about yeah, how I, I you, think we, uh, it's, oh, it's, excuse me, Heather. It's also about how, how we think about each other and about intimate revelations and how, if it is an intimate revelation, why would that end your career? Uh, that's where we are at this point. How do we think differently, Ashley? I think that we have to just realize that our social norms are changing, right? right? And we have to have a conversation about what that means. What does accountability look like in a digital age? What does it mean to teach kids what consent looks like at all levels? Uh, not just about like physical touch, but the idea that like our digital personas are an extension of our physical bodies. So we have to define those conversations from the youngest age because the only way that we can actually change social norms and social mores mm -hmm. is to start with children. And it starts with, you know, the, the small things. I love seeing parents uh, tell their kids, you don't have to accept that hug from a relative. You get to say no, right? You get to decide who touches your body. Right. Um, and that, that could be with photos too. You know, children should have the right to say, hey, mom and dad, you don't get to put my photos on the internet. Um, they get to own their and have agency over their so own identity. Uh, actually, you're saying we're a couple of generations away before um, some ex's video or picture or phone picture uh, has dire consequences. We've got to wait for the little ones to grow up before we're actually mature enough to understand that that shouldn't impact your work life or any of the other people that you, that you uh, interact with. Are, are we talking a generation? I don't think it has to be that long for some significant changes to make. As more, especially millennial women, move into managerial classes across industries, I think that we can choose to make some different decisions and say that if we see these things, we're not going to perpetuate the idea that they're disqualifying. We don't think that, um, we're not going to like slut shame women um, because they took a photo of themselves when they were 24 years old or whatever, um, that we're going to say, actually, you're still a valid person, that this is a normal thing to do, right. and that we keep on changing the conversation. All right, let me just go back to Malika, who is wrangling the community right now. Uh, this is good advice from uh, someone on Twitter who says, until online gender-based violence is outlawed, a few protective strategies are reporting the abuser online, ignoring and or blocking, releasing a statement, securing your account, filtering the content you see, and asking for help. So Heather... Shayi and Ashley are all online. You can follow them and get advice from them directly online. Of course, you need to be civilized and polite and courteous. If you learned that from the last half an hour of our conversation together. Thank you, guests. Thank you for our community as well. Malika and I will see you online. Take care.